Before I read, um, let me pray for us. Gracious Lord, thank you that the unfolding of your word brings light and understanding. As we read this passage now and hear it preached, we pray that you would make us truly wise, and we pray this for your glory. Amen. So, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Um, And now we move to chapter 3, verse 1. Now the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realised that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, "'Where are you?' He answered, "'I heard you in the garden, "'and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid.' And he said, "'Who told you that you were naked? "'Have you eaten from the tree "'from which I commanded you not to eat?' The man said, "'The woman you put here with me, "'she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it.' Then the Lord God said to the woman, "'What is this you have done?' The woman said, the snake deceived me, and I ate. Thank you, Sarah, very much indeed. Worth keeping that passage open in front of us. Uh, For four Sunday evenings here at St Andrew the Great, we're investigating what's gone wrong with the world. Sounds rather a depressing title. May I say our aim is not to be depressed, but to understand reality. We don't come to church to escape reality. We come to church to face reality and to be equipped to face reality in our daily lives. And understanding what happened in these 13 verses that we're going to look at tonight in Genesis chapter 3 will be a tremendous help in understanding the reality of the world that we live in. I can more or less promise you uh, real help in understanding the world that you and I have to navigate explained in this passage. We saw last week that Genesis analysis of what's gone wrong uh, is a bit like uh, it starts uh, with uh, a picture of what's good and what's right. A bit like on a jigsaw puzzle where you have the picture on the box and uh, all the bits are scattered, but the picture on the box helps us to understand what things should be. And that's what chapter 2 of Genesis does. You know, just this week I saw a review of a book that's come out very recently by one of the top experts on ethics in the UK. And he says, the big problem we we have is that we've lost sight of what the good life actually is. And Genesis 2 shows us that. The picture in the garden is a picture of harmony between God and humanity and between humanity and humanity in the first marriage. It's a beautiful picture. That is the flourishing life built around the vertical relationship with God and the horizontal relationship with each other. That's what we saw last week. This week we're going to see not the picture on the box, but how it was scattered and the bits were flung all over the place. We're going to learn how temptation works, what sin is and what begins to follow. Let's start with the serpent strategy, which is about how temptation works. In the garden, everything's good, but there's a real surprise. It's a kind of small surprise, which is a a talking snake. Um, the, The snake we learn right at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation is a figure for Satan. 
uh, the devil, the enemy of our souls. I think it's probably significant here that he's, uh, the, the, the figure for him, the description for him is as an animal because we're supposed to have dominion over the animals. What, what was about to happen wasn't because we were overcome by a superior force. That's one surprise. But the big surprise, I wonder if you saw it, is here is a perfect world, but a body, a being here, who is actually opposed to God and his purposes. And we ask, well, why is that the case? And I'm afraid to say that the Bible gives us no answer to that question. If the Bible doesn't give an answer, I certainly can't try. The Bible is a need-to-know book. It doesn't tell us everything. It tells us what we need to go to navigate life. It just says, here he was. And he started to speak to the woman. And what is fascinating, really fascinating, and please, may this command your attention, is how it is he manages to persuade her to do the one thing which God has told her not to do. You remember that God gave lots of choice. You can eat from any tree in the garden. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat, for on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. How does he actually get her, when she's got this clear commandment ringing in her head, to eat from that tree? If you're ever subject to temptation, which I take it you are, I am, it's particularly helpful to know what his strategy is. He's very, very subtle. Snakes also a good figure, because snakes are kind of creepy things, aren't they? Slither through the grass and do their nasty work. I'll tell you what he does. He makes sin, that is rebelling against God, seem the reasonable thing to do. You'll remember there was this clear prohibition at verse 16. Uh, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Now listen to what he says. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Have a look at that. Do a compare and contrast. Can you see how he's already twisting the truth? God hadn't said that, had he? He hadn't said you mustn't eat from any tree in the garden. In fact, God had been really generous. You can have, help yourself to anything you like. It's only one tree out of hundreds of trees that you can't eat from. He's twisting the truth. He's making God out to be a spoil sport. He never actually says, go and eat the, the fruit. He never says that. Instead, he creates a thought world for her in which eating the fruit is the plausible, sensible, wise course of action, or so it seems. And he starts by just insinuating that God is a spoil sport. He hasn't got our best interests at heart. He does that by lying about God. Wow, he's really, gosh, that's so, so unreasonable not to eat from any of the trees in the garden. Well, fortunately, Eve uh, has remembered most of the command. She says in verse 2, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you mustn't eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you'll die. That is an almost right answer, but it's not quite right. Do you spot it? Uh, Yes, you can eat from any of the trees in the garden, but as far as this one in the middle is concerned, uh, you mustn't eat from it or even touch it. Even she is falling for the lie that God's a bit more restrictive than he actually originally said. Actually, it would have been fine if they made a, probably inadvisable, but okay, if, if they made a tree house up there or hung a rope from it and swung in it or climbed the tree or something. They could have done various things. They certainly could have touched it. It was eating from the fruit that they weren't allowed to, to do. So already she's beginning to fall for the lie that God is really ultra restrictive. And then the serpent ups the pressure. Verse 4, have a look at that. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He's now directly contradicting what God has said. In other words, God is bluffing. God is just, he's bluffing. There's no bad consequences that are going to follow from eating this fruit. You will not certainly die. God had said you would, but the serpent says you won't. He denies the judgment of God. God is, oh, he's, he's too kind and gracious. The God I believe in would never put anybody to judgment. 
That just won't happen. There won't be that kind of consequence for your actions. He's bluffing. Now, this is very, very, very instructive for us. Because I think we often have a view of how temptation works in our lives, which is what I call the box of chocolates approach to temptation. Okay, you know it. If you happen to be, um, I don't know, watching a weight or being health conscious or something, and a, a delicious box of chocolates or lovely goodies comes around, you've had three already, and you, it's put in front of you. We all know the force of that, don't we? We think, oh, I shouldn't, but I... That is a kind of temptation, but that's not how temptation works here. Instead, the way that temptation uh, works in Genesis is to make the eating of the chocolate seem a plausible and wise thing to do. Not so much just eat the chocolate, but a whole worldview in which eating a chocolate will kind of do you good. It's got, these chocolates have got gut microbes in them and they, uh, they'll make you a more intelligent person. And you know, a whole load of stuff like that. And Satan uses lies. Those are his key equipment to push us in that direction. You've probably read that there is apparently an epidemic of shoplifting going on at the moment. It's become a very popular activity. Now, of course, there's the immediate temptation of the thing on the shelf, which you can put in your bag or not scan at the, at the checkout and so on, and steal from the shop. But probably most people who are doing this are, are, are supported in their actions by something that makes it seem less bad and more plausible as something to do. Ah, the big retailers have built-in margin uh, for this, which is actually partly true. So it's okay for me to, to, to take some, some stuff. The cost of living crisis is so great. Uh, why should these fat cats, the shareholders in Sainsbury's and Tesco, get my money? Uh, everybody's doing it. That's a very popular uh, plausibility structure, if you like, for doing something like that. Do you see, the actual activity is supported by a worldview in which it's easy to justify. If you're coming to church for a while, you'll know that we're engaged, uh, the Church of England's engaged in a, in a big period of temptation for the whole Church of England, the whole denomination, to change its official teaching on marriage away from the Bible pattern, the good and wonderful pattern that God has given us. And we say, well, how can that even happen? How, how, how can, you know, it's, it's laid out so clearly in the scriptures, which it is. But actually, if you talk to people on the other side of the argument um, and, um, and take them seriously and listen to them, you will often find that they carry assumptions about what God is like, what the Bible is like, the role and authority of the Bible, and what the good life is like, which are entirely different from the Bible. Ask them about their, if you're engaged in conversations with people on this, and I hope you do so politely, um, ask them about their assumptions behind, and you'll find a whole plausibility structure for this. That is why we need to be really established in the truth. If you pray, and I hope you do, the Lord Jesus gave us that prayer to pray, lead us not into temptation. Please, with that prayer, read your Bible. Make sure you understand it. Make sure you're clear on what is right and what's wrong. So when the devil comes with these, um, this, this, these clever ways of uh, creating plausibility for that which is wrong, we can actually say, no, it is written, as the Lord Jesus did when he faced temptation. So there's the serpent strategy, but let's get right to the heart of the matter. The actual moment when it really finally all went wrong. What was actually so bad about eating a piece of fruit? What was it that got through to the woman? Well, verse 5 is crucial. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's a bit more of the kind of killjoy argument used against God. It's as if he has some knowledge which he doesn't want us to have. We need to work out what that is. The knowledge of good and evil is not simply a question of knowing right and wrong, because they did already have that knowledge. It's knowing good and evil as God knows good and evil. Now, pause and have a think about this. God doesn't know good and evil by discovering it. God doesn't discover anything. You and I discover because we're limited in our faculties and there are things we don't know, lots of things we don't know, and we find them out. 
And we find out what's good, good and evil from God. God doesn't discover good and evil. Instead, he knows good and evil in the sense that he judges or decides good and evil. He makes up the rules. So being like God, knowing good and evil, is making up the rules of life for myself. Making up my own moral codes. So I need to get to London. I'm on the M11 in my uh, Ford Galaxy. And uh, I put my foot on the floor and we get up to 100. I've never tested this, actually. I'm not sure it could actually make 100. But imagine I'm barreling along at 100 and the, uh, the blue light comes up behind and I'm pulled over. And the police officer gets out and um, uh, starts to take my details and said, you were, you were speeding. The motorway limit is 70 miles an hour. And I say, actually, officer, I make up the rules around here. And on a Friday afternoon between 3 and 5, it's 110 miles an hour. And I, it's absurd, isn't it? But that's what's going on. I make up the rules for myself. I make up my own moral code. And it's a tremendously attractive way to run your life. Because... If we design moral codes of our own around ourselves, we can then feel good about keeping the moral codes that we've set for ourselves and pat ourselves on the back. What's going on here isn't just law-breaking, or there is that. It's actually law-making. You'll be like God, judging or discerning good and evil. See, all this trouble for eating of fruit, it's what it stands for. It's actually rebellion against God himself. We say, I'm free to define myself as who I am. Planned Parenthood is, uh, the, I gather, the largest organization in America providing uh, abortions. And there was a court case involving them uh, some years ago, and they set forth their case. Their case was based on an argument for human freedom. And this is how they defined the heart of human freedom. In quotes, it's the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. The right to decide it for ourselves. That's the plausibility structure which they've put up to justify what they do. And it's pretty much the same as being like God deciding, judging, knowing good and evil. And that's right at the heart of what the Bible will, in chapter 4, call sin. It's an attitude of putting the crown on my own head, wanting to be God in my own world, wanting to be the legislator, the one who makes up the rules, developing my own moral code, doing life my way. Me being me. And that was what Eve did when she took the apple. It's all over so quickly. Chapter 6, verse 6. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. It's all over so quickly. But there is the Bible's analysis of the heart of the human problem. All of our problems are ultimately traceable to this one problem. Humanity And I have to say from what the Bible says that that includes all of us in this room. We're all humans. Putting the crown on our own head, wanting to be like God in making up the rules. That is a disaster. Because there is, in fact, in the universe only one God. There is only one person who can ultimately put up the rules, only one person on the throne. Rachel and I used to live in Exeter, um, down in, in Devon, and the cathedral was quite near our house, a magnificent building, and when we had friends to stay, uh, we'd sometimes take them on a tour. And one of the things that you can't help noticing in Exeter Cathedral is this massive bishop's throne. It's got a huge canopy over it. Uh, how we got from the New Testament to that, I don't quite know. But anyway, there's a throne that the bishop uh, sits on during cathedral services. Well, I had some, we had some friends down for a weekend one time, and... Uh, uh, we took them on the, on the usual cathedral tour. And my friend, who happened to be an ordained clergyman in the Church of England, um, 
who had a bit of the rebel about him, decided he wanted to sit on the throne. We could take his photo and stuff like this. He sat on the throne. Now, I happened to know the bishop, and I knew his house was right next door, and I'm thinking, what's going to happen if the bishop walks in and finds somebody else uh, sitting on his throne? Someone who has no right to be there. But seriously, what does God do? What's going to happen when God finds somebody else occupying his throne? Someone putting the crown on their head, deciding they want to be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, let's see what happens next. The cover-up comes. Uh, Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What happened, first of all, was literally a cover-up. I coined the word Eden Gate for this. Okay? The, the, the suffix gate goes back to 1972 when there was the Watergate affair in America, and there was a massive cover-up which went all the way up to the Oval Office. Uh, and have you noticed how in common conversation that word, that suffix gate is stuck onto all kinds of different things? You know, kitchen gate, because if, if, if I don't know, well, there isn't kitchen gate, but anyway, um, if we were covering up something about the kitchen. Now, this is Eden gate, because there's a cover-up that is going on. And what you find is a deliberate contrast with the end of chapter 2, because Adam and his wife are both naked and they felt no shame, and now they're covering stuff up. And it... It stands for something. It stands for a relationship of beautiful openness, which is now replaced by a life where we can't be completely open with anybody about everything in our lives. You see, once we start living according to our own desires, we'll have things we don't want other people to know about. We don't fully trust each other. We don't know what the other person would do if they knew all about us. That is life, isn't it? What a tragedy. What a contrast from the openness and intimacy that was there in chapter 2, and which actually we really long for. It's a lovely thing to be able to open up in trust to somebody. But that gets taken away or compromised here. And it's replaced by a word of confidentiality, of hiding things, of not telling the whole truth. And the man and the woman have been so close, but they're not so close now. And then in verse 8, we get this extraordinary game of hide and seek. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. I mean, it's totally pointless to try and hide from God. But they tried. I remember when I was at school, we we discovered that there was a a well-known brand of aerosol antiperspirant, and I will not tell you what it was, that was inflammable. Please don't try this at home. And we had such fun spraying this out of the windows of the buildings and, and you know, making the place look like Kuwait at night. And I remember my horror that when one of the teachers walked up, and it was, uh, it was evening, and so it was dark, and sees all these flares going out of the window. <laughs> and of course, what, what did we do? We just scarp it. It was totally pointless. Within five minutes, he rounded us all up, because you could see who we were. But here are Adam and Eve hiding behind the trees of the garden. It's very noteworthy, this, because it's the opposite of what we think. People sometimes say, oh, everywhere humanity is seeking God. There's a long quest for God, and everybody's really looking for God. Now, it's a wonderful thing when sometimes God's Spirit gets to work in people, and they start to seek Him, and that might be your position this evening. But it doesn't come to us naturally. Most of humanity is on the run from God, actually. Try raising the subject of the Christian gospel sometimes. You find a a pushback on that or a coldness and so on. Actually, they were hiding. And so have humans hid from God ever since. And there's this blame game going on as well. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said... Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And uh, we get to verse 12. Now, Sarah read this so well, but I never know how to put the emphasis in this verse. Okay, the man, here's one way of doing it. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Or it could be, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. He's either blaming his wife or he's blaming God. One way or another, 
he's passing the buck. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. I wonder if that's the world of your work, or your friends, or the office. It's always somebody else's faults. Ah, I was having a bad day. It was my upbringing. It was my hormones. It was my wife. Who put that ridiculous traffic light there? And so on. So what we've got already, before God, in a sense, more directly gets involved, which you'll see next week, and says some more about what the world's going to be like in future, we've already got a world in which we're making up the rules for ourselves when we do it our way, And when that brings us into collision with one another, openness is gone and blame and buck passing starts. When God warned of the terrible effects from this, he wasn't bluffing at all. But there is a note of hope. Do you know, embedded in this passage, in the midst of the horrors of what happened at the fall, And the horrors in our own world where our lives continue to be shattered as we take the same attitudes. There is the most amazing note of hope. Have a look at verse 9. I mentioned this game of hide and seek. The Lord God called to the man, where are you? Now, of course, this isn't because God doesn't know where they are. Of course he knows where they are. So why is this recorded for us? It's there because God is being introduced right from this early chapter in the Bible as the God who seeks and who saves what is lost. He wants to confront them with their sin, but he wants them back. Even now, after their rebellion, he calls out to them, where are you? In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus says he came to seek and to save what was lost. It is God's attitude to rebellious people. We put the crown on our own head, we sit in God's throne, we deserve his judgment, but still, where are you? He wants them back. My wife Rachel's family has a very old and very precious letter which was written by Rachel's great-grandfather when he was 17. A chap called Tommy, and it's dated 29th of September, 1882. He was writing to his sister Evie about a meeting he'd been to in the drill hall in Plymouth that week. This is what he said. My dear Evie, thank you for your letter. I'm writing to tell you some good news, which you'll be glad to hear. I went to one of Moody and Sankey's meetings on Tuesday, and there I was saved. He spoke... Uh, Moody was an American preacher, uh, D.L. Moody, who'd come over uh, from America. He spoke on the ninth verse of the third of Genesis. It is, where art thou? He said that that was the first question that God ever asked man in the Bible, the first question. And it was the first question that people ought to ask themselves. And he said that there were two more he was going to to speak about, and they were, where are you going, and how are you going to spend eternity? I don't think he could have chosen better ones. And that's God's approach to us. I don't know, you read this chapter and you think, yes, I can recognize rebellion in my own heart. I can recognize areas where I've fouled up. I can recognize areas where I've believed the lies or where I've lied to myself and tried to justify my own actions. I've kept God at arm's length. I've rebelled against him and I deserve God's judgment. But God says, where are you? First question he asks in the Bible. And of course, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, into our world to seek and to save us and to bring us back. Well, we come to the end. And just with these 13 verses, don't you think that Genesis' analysis of the world makes sense? And it makes sense of your and my life. It faces us with reality. It shows us the nature of temptation, where things go wrong. It takes us to the very heart of what, what it means to rebel against God, to decide that we want to make the rules for ourselves. It shows us some of the immediate consequences. But, but, 
it also includes the question, where are you? Isn't that a very important question? And can I leave that question to ferment in your mind this evening? What a merciful and wonderful God that we have. Let's, let's pray for these things. Lord God, thank you so much for shining a light here on temptation. Help us to know the truth. Build us up so that the truth will give us real freedom and keep us secure against worldviews in which what you say is sin seems plausible. Thank you for what this passage shows us about what's gone wrong, our rebellion and its consequences. But thank you for your grace calling us. Where are you? Please help each one of us to respond. We ask this in Jesus' name.